While staying in Norfolk earlier this month, I travelled down from Norwich to the small Suffolk village of Woolpit to visit one of the county's great medieval parish churches. St Mary's Parish Church in Woolpit is a building of great architectural and artistic interest. Above all else, I was most excited to see the 15th century south porch, richly decorated and of two storeys, rising in height well above the adjoining south aisle. The east face of the porch has exquisite chequered flush work, and the west face is flint rubble, in contrast to the neat ashlar masonry of the south face, which is dotted with niches and other forms of sophisticated decoration. Stepping through the threshold of the outer porch door beneath that splendid medieval façade, you enter into a smaller ambulatory space than expected, with low benches on either side. I'll admit that the grandeur and height of the external elevation distracted me from not immediately apprehending the proportions of this building in its entirety. The porch is grand, it is tall, but otherwise it is of modest proportions and not particularly wide. So my first impression of the interior setting of the nave and its aisles alone is that looking east it appears to reflect the character of other great East Anglian churches. Beneath the magnificent 15th century hammer beam roof which many visitors make a journey to see specifically, the church has a relatively smaller overall footprint when compared with several of the other great medieval Suffolk churches. It is Woolpit's arrangement of furnishings and fittings that set it apart from the rest. As Simon Knott writes, there is a feeling of gravitas, of dark wood, tiles and stone. Wood and stone are the predominant material qualities here. In my reading of the space, it is the wooden features that take command. The blanket of benches feel compact in the width of the central worship space, albeit extenuated under the large, clear, glazed south aisle windows admitting plenty of natural light, which is very pleasing aesthetically. The bench ends, some of which, but not all, are medieval originals, have figures of non-allegorical animals, dogs mostly, and some lion and bears. The nave is lofty, of that there is no doubt, but it is not what I would call an especially broad building by comparison, though a contributing factor to this may be the result of other material changes over time. For my money, something has happened in an attempt to mitigate the different floor levels around the retained pew platforms and stepped access to the chancel, which feels slightly incongruous with an attempt to both meet the equal access needs of a much-used church and to limit the harm to the character of the listed building in its adaptation. If that sounds slightly pretentious, then I'm also being slightly picky in my reflections. At this point it is worth saying that I thought the ramp down from the south entrance into the nave around the steps to be well designed in its setting, though it appears more temporary solutions have been provided in the aisles and chancel. There is also an aesthetic aspect to this which is largely personal, which almost every restored church has, where I don't feel that the combination of various carpets and surface finishes necessarily work in harmony. The gaze of the angels in the aisle ceilings weigh down upon you, as they are suspended far closer to our earthly level than their counterparts in the central nave ceiling, which we shall look at next. The so-called angel ceiling of the central nave is a sophisticated construction with wall posts reaching down between the clerestory level windows and a supporting cast of figures both angelic, human and beastly. What we see today if we crane our necks up of a major restoration century following centuries after a much rehearsed inspection recorded by the then deputy of renowned 17th century iconoclast William Dowsing, the Puritan inspector of the churches of Cambridgeshire and Suffolk. It is purported that there are over 100 angels altogether, but not all are original to the pre-Reformation period. Although I seem to have arrived in Woolpit simply to waffle on about floor levels, many visitors also come to Woolpit to see the chancel screen. Another 15th century addition to the late medieval church, it too has undergone some alterations in the past. The gates, for example, are an early 17th century replacement, and there has been a new structure fitted above the medieval beam at the top, bearing the date 1750 and the arms of King George II. The figures on the dardo panels along the bottom were repainted in 1892. 
for anybody struggling to identify the eight holy figures, their names have been painted beneath them. One thing I noticed on the chancel screen when taking some photos was that there's actually carved birds in some of the posts on the structure as well. It's not just all painted, although the birds have been painted over, but there's also traces of them where they went right up as well, but it looks like a sort of lacquer that's been then sort of etched into. Probably entirely wrong there, but a lot of it's gone, obviously, but there's one bit where it survives, and I think that is a brilliant detail to what most people look at, is the obviously very amazing painted panels with various saints, St Peter, Mary Magdalene and all the others. But all these little details just really bring it together, I think it's brilliant. One thing I've noticed here is the tiny door that will have gone up to the platform on top of the um, rood screen, up to the rood loft, but look how narrow that is. How on earth would someone fit up there? I mean, clearly there's that little aperture there which gives it some light. But, I mean, look at the how narrow that is. And you can actually open this door and see the stairs going up. But, yeah, wow, look at that. Those stairs would not want to be going up there. No wonder people had accidents. How far up can you get? Oh, you can go all the way up. You can go up to the level. But um, obviously it doesn't go anywhere. Should we, see if we, should we see if we can see where the other door will have been? So it will have been up there, which has been rendered over. You can't even see the outline of it. But that's where it would have been, somewhere up there. It's a strange thing. It's a good spot. St Mary's Church history is covered in the short guidebook compiled by the Woolpit History Group. It contains more useful information than most short pamphlets of this sort you can pick up in any old church. On the final page is a reminder that this is also a living church, so please take your time to say a prayer for those who live and work in Woolpit. Of course, if praying isn't your thing, and all those who choose not to pray are of course welcome in these buildings, you can support this historic and important local asset by kindly leaving a donation. Thank you for watching this video and see you on another walk or church visit in the future. Please like and subscribe.